commenting on today's reading briefly, readings briefly. Uh, I'll start with the epistle because it's the least connected to the others as the way the lectionary is laid out. But there's a very, the, the passage from Ephesians today is a very critical passage because it synthesizes a very important point uh, about uh, our, under, our relationship with Christ. And that is, in the phrase, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, we find those three aspects to our unity with Christ, which I've spoken about before frequently. That is, in one Lord we find his authority as king, and that we must obey when it comes to us through all legitimate means. One faith is the teaching that we are taught by Christ and through his church, uh, which we must adhere to. And one baptism is the first of the entire sacramental system, which we must participate in as instituted by Christ. And all three of those constitute our union with him. The reading and the psalm naturally are tying into the gospel, and I'm assuming for all of you here in a very obvious way that the foreshadowing we have in uh, the miracle in the uh, Old Testament uh, is of what we read in today's gospel. And of course, the psalm praises what God is providing for us by feeding us. So I'd like to, uh, as we are wrapping up this series on the Mass, focus over the next couple of weeks uh, on the gospel reading because the gospel reading uh, for the next couple of Sundays is coming from John chapter 6. The Gospel of Mark is the shortest gospel in year B. Since we're reading from St. Mark, we have to kind of supplement a little bit to fill out the year, so we use St. John, and John chapter 6 is a very essential chapter for us to be reading. And so in my, in my last few Sundays speaking about the Eucharist, uh, I'm going to do so hand in hand with this gospel chapter, which is about the Holy Eucharist. I want to start with a little caveat, because unfortunately this has been said, and it's probably said fairly commonly, although not as much these days, please God. The miracle in John chapter 6 is not that everyone's hearts got open and they shared their lunches. That is absolute and utter nonsense, which is not borne out by the text, nor by anything that has followed in the tradition of the church. While we certainly ask for graces to change our hearts, this is a real miracle, which is a fulfillment of what is seen in the Old Testament reading, uh, in addition to other parts of the Old Testament, and which points to the greatest uh, gift of God, the Holy Eucharist, the mystery of faith. Let's walk through some of these verses uh, so we can delve into them a little bit more deeply before I conclude with some comments on the Eucharist. So the first thing is, is and for today at least, most of these commentaries come from St. John Chrysostom, although I do pull from others in the following weeks. But in this part of the Gospel passage, one of the things he notes is, is that this crowd that's following him because of the signs that he was doing for the sick. And he, he says that though favored with such teaching, they were influenced less by it than by the miracles, a sign of their low state of belief. We're told that Jesus goes up on the mountain and he sits down with his disciples. It's very important when we read uh, the Gospel of St. John that we recognize that the major themes of his Gospel are all summarized in his prologue. So the first 18 verses of John's Gospel tells us what the entire Gospel is about. Uh, and there's a lot of comparisons between Jesus and Moses in this Gospel. So in the prologue we read, the, through Moses the law was given to us, through Jesus Christ grace came to us in truth. No man has ever seen God, but now his only begotten Son who abides in the bosom of the Father has become our interpreter. So the, re the reason I bring this up here is because this is the first point in this passage where this connection with Moses is seen. Mountains are the privileged place of encounter with God. One of the reasons why I've, I've commented in the past on the elevation of the sanctuary. Uh, but Moses, of course, being the most famous in salvation history for having this encounter, of course, Elijah as well. And so we see this in Christ here on the mountain. We also see uh, that, biblically speaking, sitting was a customary posture for teaching. So we have a lesson going on here. 
St. John also comments that the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. <clears throat> this goes back to Moses again, because it was through Moses that the Passover was instituted. And in St. John's Gospel, one of the most important things to know about the Gospel and to see in his Gospel is how much attention he draws to the connection between Christ and the Passover lamb and Christ is that fulfillment. So Philip asks, where are we going to buy enough bread to eat? Sorry, our Lord asks him, where are we going to buy the bread? And then, of course, Philip is like, I, how are we going to do this, right? And obviously, our Lord is not asking the question because he doesn't know what he's going to do. Our Lord is asking the question to get his disciples thinking about the situation, in particular, for them to recognize that they are incapable of addressing this need by themselves. This is a daunting task. So we know the story, especially since we just heard it. He takes the loaves and he gives thanks and distributes them, right? So the first thing to note here, and this is again St. John Chrysostom, he says he did not really want any material to work from, but only made use of created things for this purpose in order to show that no part of the creation was severed from his wisdom. In other words, what I spoke about last week with the sacraments, the fact that God uses matter to save us by taking on a body and then making that salvation available to us in the sacraments with both matter and form. The word here for given thanks is a, I always have to, give me a second, eucaristesas diadoke. Eucharistia is where, you're, of course, the word that we're using here, and that is thanksgiving. And you should also note that in some translations, our Lord gives the, the, the multiplied bread to the disciples first, and then they distribute it. When they're done eating, he then tells them to gather up the fragments. And this should teach us, of course, among other things, a respect for the particles of the Eucharist, that the way we treat the Blessed Sacrament is such that nothing is lost and therefore disrespected and desecrated. And when they fill them up, or when they gather these fragments, there are 12 baskets left over. Now, the Jews have a particular numerology, which we see throughout the scriptures. You're familiar with at least some of them, for example, the number 40, or the number 7, and the number 6. Um, but in this case, we are looking at the fullness of the people of God. The 12 tribes of Israel was God's chosen people, and that is fulfilled now in the church, which is founded on the 12 apostles. So this number 12 refers to the fact that there are these 12 apostles, the foundation of the church, and it is the apostles and their successors with the priests that minister with them that distribute the Eucharist to the people and feed them with the heavenly bread. And finally, we read that when Jesus realized they were about to take him by force and make him king, he withdraws again to the mountain. Yeah, the mountain, that place of encounter with God. Chrysostom again nicely, snarkily points out, see what the belly can do. They care no more for the violation of the Sabbath, referring to previous parts of the gospel. All their zeal for God is fled now that their bellies are filled which should teach us the dangers of intemperance, the sin of gluttony, and voting for politicians who promise us things. Solamente porque yo viví decir algo en español. El propósito que quiero predicar hoy es la importancia de este milagro en el Evangelio de multiplicación del pan, pero más que eso, hablando sobre la Eucaristía, el deseo de nuestro Señor de intimidad con nosotros y especialmente a través de ese sacramento en la misa en la comunión y en el tabernáculo donde él nos espera. So, in light of all of this, I want to make just one more comment then to wrap up about applying this more specifically to the Eucharist. Again, this whole chapter is going to be about the Eucharist. Ethan, no drama. Okay. So, the, obviously, our Lord is setting this up 
with uh, the discourse on the bread of life, which we're going to hear in following weeks uh, in Mass. But the, the, the particular aspect of the Eucharist that I want to uh, draw our attention to, again, as we start wrapping up this series, is the purpose of the Blessed Sacrament, and that is the intimacy that God wants to have with us. The fact that He institutes the Eucharist because it's not just enough to have Jesus in your heart. He wants to be really united to you, body and soul, completely. We see this all throughout salvation history. It should not be a surprise. He walks with Adam and Eve in the garden. After, even after Adam rejects God, he makes himself present in a visible, miraculous way in the tabernacle and in the temple with his presence with the people. And then, of course, because he so loves the world, he sends his only begotten son, who is Emmanuel, that is, God with us, born of Mary. And even after he dies and resurrects, and before he ascends, he promises to be with us until the end of time. And he does that, of course, in many ways. He does that in the priesthood. He does that in the sacred scriptures. But in no way is Christ present to us like he is in the most blessed sacrament. And so I just want to wrap, finish then with some words which I, I have read before, but you've slept since then. From the book In Sinu Yezu, which I highly recommend uh, all of you read. There's about 25% of it that really does only apply to priests, but this other 75% is worth reading those parts as well. And the, the points I want to make here is, uh, are about this desire for intimacy. We see it in the scriptures, we read it in the scriptures, we see it in the crucifix and in the icon of the divine mercy, but I believe it's a little bit more motivating and it's even more touching when you hear it in such stark and clear and personal terms. I'm just going to read a couple of the lines from different passages here. He says, nothing can replace the intimate experience of my Eucharistic friendship. And this is the experience I offer to you and to all who seek my Eucharistic face, all who offer a sacrifice of time to my Eucharistic heart. When you are before me, you are the privileged friend of my heart, keeping me company in my loneliness and allowing me to share with you my sorrows, my grieving over sin, and my designs for a priesthood made pure and radiant with holiness. Seek my Eucharistic face, for I never cease from seeking your face. This is the mystery of my divine friendship, that I, the infinite and all-holy God, should seek the face of a sinful creature, love the sight of it, and take delight in seeing it turn toward me. Adoration is the exchange of love. It was no mere development of ritual practice when my church began to reserve my most holy body in the tabernacles prepared for me. The sacrament of my body and blood is the pledge and the expression of my divine friendship and the sign of my heart's desire and resolve to remain present until the end of the ages for the sake of all who seek my friendship and would know the love of my heart for them. 